A few years before the release of Super Mario 64, it seemed like the Super Nintendo was going from strength to strength in more ways for one. Donkey Kong Country 1 and 2 made for better 16-bit graphics than ever, and even Super Mario RPG looked nice. But even that Mario spin-off was almost completely overtaken by the release of Super Mario 64, and so was the Donkey Kong Country series, with its third installment titled Donkey Kong Country 3 Dixie Kong's Double Trouble, released in 1996. The story that takes place after Donkey Kong Country 2 is shown more in the manual, as you see Dixie simply appearing at the world map when starting a new game. Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong leave behind a scribbled note saying that they're exploring the islands. Days go by as Dixie wonders why her boyfriend Diddy hasn't returned, and so explores the Northern Hemisphere looking for him. While exploring, Dixie finds Wrinkly Kong talking about mysterious banana birds, Funky working on vehicles while looking after Dixie's toddler cousin Kitty Kong, and worse yet, a bunch of Kremlins, which surely doesn't bode well for Donkey and Diddy Kong. It is a bit of a shame that the first stage of the game lacks more of a story introduction in contrast to the Banana Horde Cave and Kidnapping Letter on the Pirate Ship seen in the first two games, but the simple nature of the story is easily forgiven and it allows the player to get right into playing the game. Much of the game will be familiar to anyone who has played the previous games, specifically its production values. Once again, this chapter in the Donkey Kong Country series looks amazing, especially for its time. It is not noticeably different to before, but with the use of pre-rendered 3D sprites, detailed backdrops, and the realistic mix with a cartoony, it is overall great and sharp. It feels like it's lacking a bit of colour and charm from the previous game. When you win a level, Dixie and Kitty just grab a rope to raise a flag. Whatever happened to Diddy and Dixie's music? This also does apply to the music, somewhat. David Wise didn't do as much of the music this time, with a majority of tracks composed by Evelyn Fisher or Novakovic. The soundtrack is not that bad, but it's more reliant on ambience and it's not as catchy or as upbeat, even with a dark tone from the previous game being mostly stripped away. Still, some tunes are hard to forget, such as the familiar Calm Waterworld. <laughs> Fitting tree top tumble. The electronic guitar of rock face rumble. And Mill Fever seemingly borrowing melodies from Beatles songs. sound effects simply get the job done like they did before. No monkeying around in that department. The gameplay is very similar to the previous games, especially the second one. The 2D side-scroller gameplay remains intact, where you take control of one monkey, either Dixie or Kitty, with the other taken along behind you. You move and jump around to get from point A to point B, while keeping an eye out for not just deadly enemies and traps, but secret bonuses as well. Like previously, the differences between Dixie Con and Kitty Con are important to note if you want to complete levels successfully and with all the secrets. Dixie or Kitty can throw the other monkey around. Kitty, being the strong one, can throw Dixie and therefore himself to out of reach areas, while Dixie can barely throw Kitty just to open up passageways. Dixie throwing Kitty is rarely needed, but the change dynamic in contrast to the second Donkey Kong Country is a nice touch. Kitty may be a toddler, but he is essentially the equivalent of a strong Donkey Kong from the first game and holds barrels in front of him. Plus, he can skip on water like a stone, a mechanic that is not used a whole lot and can be hard to execute. You also have to excuse his crying. Dixie Kong controls the same as she did previously, with being able to hover and glide, and holds barrels above her head instead. You also have the option of looking for bananas, K-O-N-G Kong letters, or balloons for extra lives, and boy will you need those extra lives in this game. So, if all this gameplay sounds similar to before, is it even worth giving this game a look? Well, it has to be said that Donkey Kong Country 3 features some of the most creative ideas and level designs and gimmicks in the original trilogy. This also goes back to how the Northern Hemisphere setting looks. 
In contrast to the jungle woodland combo and pirate theme of before, the theme seems to be that more of a European country vibe where nature and machinery are mixed together, sometimes to dangerous effect. Exploration of this world is done differently. The first two Donkey Kong Country games saw you just going through one level after another, a very typical side-scroller progression. But in this game, you get a vehicle from Funky almost right away that allows you to traverse the water to not only go to the level filled worlds, but also go to other places and secret areas, and in a surprising break from tradition, have the option to choose from two places which world in the game will be the third you explore. Plus, this makes it easier to save your game, revisit previous levels, or visit Funky, and at no cost. The more you progress, the better vehicles you get from Funky and go to areas you previously couldn't. The aforementioned secret areas generally amount to caves where you play a game of Simon Says to release a banana bird, more on that later. The other places generally amount to the homes of the brothers Bear. These bears can help you with hints and items, but you usually have to pay with bear coins scattered throughout the levels. With these bears items comes a trading sequence that helps you find more secret areas and banana birds. It is a little tacked on, but a commendable idea nevertheless. In each world, you do however have to go through one level after another. While level types such as treetops and cliffs do get recycled a little too much from world to world, a downgrade from the more consistent world themes of her second game, each level has something different to offer. There's a level where you have to get rid of rats and spinning wheel mechanisms to open doors. There's a level where you have to evade a giant saw cutting a tree. There's a level where an off-screen enemy relentlessly follows you with their crosshair to shoot projectiles. There's a level where the controls are different. And there's more besides, including end of world bosses who put up a tough fight. One of which is a snowman who you actually throw snowballs at instead of jumping on it. If you can be Cranky in Swanky's target shooting minigame, you can beat a snowman, right? The creativity and breadth of these concepts is something to marvel at. But only to a point. Out of the original three Donkey Kong Country games, this game feels like it's the most challenging, and it can sometimes be very frustrating and even punishing or unfair at points. The previous games were challenging to a degree, and those wanting a challenge will definitely get one here, especially in the later worlds. Some of the problems do come from the camera and enemy placement. The camera feels almost worse than before, making it hard to see what enemies are in front of you, especially in the auto-scrolling levels. The enemy placements do require quite a precision. The controls are the same as previous games, which is fine, but doing and landing the right jumps is as tight as ever, if not more so in this game. Another problem, which may depend more so on how you liked the previous games, can extend to the animal buddies and bonuses. Animals such as the spider squitter, the parrot squawks, and the sawfish on guard return, but surprisingly the rhino rambi is replaced with the cute elephant Ellie, who can jump on some of the tougher enemies and squirt water, but is obviously really scared of rats, forcing her to run out of your control. Oh no. There are quite a few levels where you purely take control of the animal buddy, just like in the second game. But then there are the bonus barrels. Whether it's collecting a number of stars, green bananas, bashing the baddies, or getting to the end of the bonus stage itself, you have to do well in a usually strict time limit to get the bonus coin. The bonus barrels are, for the most part, thankfully as easy to find as they were in the second game, and encourage some fun exploration. But the actual bonus stages themselves feature enemies and hazards alongside the time limit and some of the time, this can be very frustrating. The worst part is that if you fail the bonus stage, getting back to the barrel in some levels can be way too dangerous, forcing you to restart part of the level, or in the case of one very hard secret level, force you to restart the entire level to get to the barrel again. Players shouldn't necessarily have to be punished as much as this just for failing a bonus stage. The second game mostly differs better. There's an additional secret in each level in the form of DK coins, guarded by a Kremlin named Coin. To get it, you have to hit his vulnerable back with a steel barrel. There are a few times where it is hard to get him, which can also result in you losing the steel barrel forever, instead of it magically appearing again. This, like some bonus stages, can force you to trek through a level again, but most of the time it is actually quite fun to get rid of coin using a steel barrel. So what does all this extra challenge in getting all these bonus coins, DK coins, and banana birds amount to? 
a 103% rating and an alternative ending that, while nice, feels like an anticlimactic end to a trilogy of games. Considering the games in the Donkey Kong Country trilogy overall, it is hard to not draw comparisons. The graphics, sound and gameplay are, for the most part, very similar to before, something which may have led to people not trying this game in favour of the 3D games of Nintendo 64 and even PlayStation that were looking too impossible to not indulge in. But behind all that familiarity is a surprisingly fun and above all creative 2D side-scrolling platformer package. Sure, some parts of a package don't add up, such as the slightly underwhelming graphics and music, frustrating moments with several levels and bonuses, and a mostly anticlimactic ending. But hey, we didn't know at the time that we would be getting Donkey Kong Country Returns or Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze, heck even a Game Boy Advance version of this game, and a Nintendo Switch online release where you can <clears throat> cheat with save states, especially during the hard mode that you can unlock with a cheat code. Is it the best or worst of a Donkey Kong Country trilogy? With the con dynamics carried over from the second game, the creativity on offer, not to mention the challenge for those who are looking for it, it is hard to say. Even if it may be the worst, it's very, very far from being a bad game. Whether playing it alongside its predecessors or as a standalone game, you should have a good time with this adventure set in the Donkey Kong universe. The launch of Nintendo 64 was years ago, so perhaps now is as good a time as ever to revisit or discover this game. It may be better than its reputation suggests.